Are we starting to see some line combinations start to work for the Minnesota Wilds? We recap the win against Edmonton. Sam Steele's resurgence as 1C. And a look ahead to the weekends today on Locked on Wild. You're Locked on Wild. Your daily podcast on the Minnesota Wild. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Locked On Wild, your daily Minnesota Wild podcast, part of the Locked On Sports Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked on Wild your first listen each and every day. Just a reminder, Locked on Wild is available on your favorite podcast platforms for absolutely no charge. On today's episode of Locked on Wild, we recap a 5-3 to three win over the Edmonton Oilers. We'll look at how the grief line got their swagger back and held Connor McDavid quiet for a good portion of the game. We'll talk about Sam Steele helping the scoring from the top line. We'll look at how the Wild have done over their last five games. And we'll turn our attention to a big weekend in front of a big road trip for the Wild next week. My name is Seth Topol, your daily Minnesota Wild insider. And we are happy to be celebrating a win last night by the Minnesota Wild. Five to three over the Edmonton Oilers. What's the saying? It's not how you start, it's how you finish. Because it was an Edmonton team that was coming in after a game against Chicago in which they got pushed to the brink. So they were tired. There were some tired legs coming into this game. And if the Wild, who were rested, were able to play their game, play their style, it was pretty likely that they were going to be able to outlast the Edmonton Oilers. But early on, The Oilers got some life, courtesy of a uh, power play goal off of a John Merrill penalty and a situation where I get why um, I get why Merrill did what he did. And I suppose instead of having a breakaway or an odd man rush situation, uh, you opt to you opt to let your penalty kill diffuse that situation. And the penalty kill, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, has been real good for the Wild here over the uh, the last handful of games. So a shot by Merrill that was blocked and the puck caromed away and would have allowed for either a breakaway or an odd man rush. And so Merrill draws the interference penalty to prevent that scoring chance to allow the team time to regroup. and. Um, Ultimately, it is a penalty kill that ends up giving up a goal, uh, courtesy of some brilliance and an absolute missile shot from Leon Dreisaitl. So I I get it, but at the same time, it's probably a penalty that you don't need to take, but I can understand Merrill's reasoning in his head in a bang-bang situation as to why he did what he did. Ultimately, though, you get that power play goal from Edmonton, then you get a two-on-one with McDavid and Dreisaitl, and good luck stopping that. Uh, the Wild tried, but at the end of the day, uh, they ended up allowing McDavid pretty much free reign on the left side of the net. And it didn't matter if there were two Mark Andre Fleury's in the crease; you're not going to stop that goal. And even on the power play for Edmonton. You just let Leon Dreisaitl leak out to the right with nobody really pursuing him, and that allowed him point blank to shoot, and uh, it was 2-1 to one at that point. However, the Wild tightened some things up, and they end up coming away with a win. It probably should have been a 5-2 win, but there was a goal by Edmonton with like three seconds left to make it a little closer. But it was impressive to see the Wild adjust during the course of this game and to lean on a little physicality to really wear out the Oilers down the stretch. Uh, some numbers for you. And uh, we'll start with Jewel Erickson, who continues to have a really impressive stretch of hockey. Um, ended up with a goal. Wild had a couple power play goals here uh, in this one. 
Jewel Erickson Eck had five on five versus Connor McDavid tonight. Collectively, there was 11 minutes, four seconds of ice time in which they were both on the ice at the same time. In that span, Erickson Eck held Connor McDavid and his line to just three shots on six attempts. That equates out to a .17 expected goals against, according to Natural Stat Tricks. So no Jonas Brodeen, but Jewel Erickson Eck, one of his vintage defensive performances. And so you look at it, 83% of the time, the uh, the Wilds, if there's a goal scored, if there would have been a goal scored uh, with Jewel Erickson Eck on the ice, 83% of the time when those two are on the ice, uh, that goal is being scored by the Wild. And those are phenomenal odds. So really good job by Jewel Erickson Eck to uh, help put the clamps on Connor McDavid down the stretch. Now, stopping those guys, especially with the start that they've been on this season, stopping them completely is not easy. And I think that makes more impressive the fact that we've seen Jonas Brodeen do it on a couple of different occasions when lined up against Connor McDavid. And so you hope to slow them down enough and make it so that those are the only guys that are going to beat you. There wasn't anybody else for Edmonton that really showed up on the stat sheet tonight. It was those two. And after that, the Wild really put the clamps on everything that uh, that the Oilers were doing throughout the course of the night. They really limited the amount of opportunities that the Oilers had to shoot. Fleury ended up facing 21 shots total over the course of the night. So the Wild defensively did a really good job of preventing Edmonton from getting anything going. And in a situation where the only two players that are really doing anything are Dreisaitl and McDavid, if you can get contributions on the other end from the rest of the roster, you like your odds. So a good win for the Wild. And now, before we take a look at some of the line combinations, let's talk about this. Minnesota Wild in their last five games. They're 4-1 and one over that span with the loss coming to the Toronto Maple Leafs in the Matt Murray net moorings game. Uh, we've talked about that at length, so I'm not going to get into that any further. But that's the only loss during this five-game stretch. It includes wins against the Carolina Hurricanes, uh, the Oilers last night. So quality opponents throughout. It's not like they, they did beat Arizona, but... There are quality opponents in that mix. The Wild in those five games, 20 goals for, so that equates out to four goals per game. They've given up 12 goals in those five games, so that's rough. That's a little over two. The Wild's power play in that span has started to heat up once again. They are six for 14 in the last five games, which is um, it's about 42% on the power play over the last five games. Wild penalty kill, their only blemish in the last five games was the goal that the Oilers scored uh, in last night's game. Kirill Kaprizov in the last five games, he has four goals. Non-Kaprizov goals in the five games, 16 different goals scored by other players. Ladies and gentlemen, we talked about that as a big issue for this team uh, at points throughout the season is that the secondary scoring has completely dried up. Of the 20 goals that the Wild have scored in their last five games, 16 of them have come from non Kirill Kaprizov players. So he is continuing to go on the heater that he's on, and other players are starting to pick it up as well. So that is an encouraging sign for this team as the season continues. Now, part of that is because we're starting to see some line combinations gel to the point that we're not seeing the lines juggled as much as we were to start the season. And so we'll take a look at that impact and having the grief line back as we continue to recap last night's win against Edmonton and look forward to the weekend to come. All that on the way here on Locked on Wild. 
Today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline.net. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info plus stats, news, and analysis. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From football to basketball to soccer and even esports, they've got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. They are always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. So head over to their website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action at BetOnline, where the game starts. Continuing today's episode of Locked on Wild, once again, thanks for making Locked on Wild your first listen each and every day. For your second listen, make sure you check out the Locked on Sports Today podcast. Everything you need to know from the wide world of sports, all in one place. Locked on Sports Today is available on your favorite podcast platforms, absolutely free of charge. So the Wild are starting to get some secondary scoring back. Well, that is no coincidence with the fact that we're starting to see some line combinations gel and be consistently put together here at this point in the season. It starts with Sam Steele at the top. Steele has played very well since he hopped up on the top line at center. And that position, without Ryan Hartman in the lineup, the position has been a little bit of a black hole. You had Freddie Goudreau there for a while, and it just has felt like in order for that line to really take off, they just needed somebody at the center position to make some plays and to just keep up with those two guys and be able to you know, just help contribute to the offense that that line generates on a nightly basis. And Sam Steele has done that over uh, the last several uh, games. He had a goal in last night's game. And if you look at his uh, overall log for the last few, he is uh, he's bumped his his time on ice up to roughly around 16 and a half minutes per game since he uh, hopped up on the line with Kirill Kaprizov. And in that span, he has three goals. He has four points in that span. And uh, he has been a plus player over the course of that span as well. Plus minus, you know, at points it's been positive. Some points it's been negative. But uh, overall, a plus four. He's shooting, you know, between two and four shots per night on that line. But we're seeing, you know, just some of the the nifty passes uh, and taking advantage of the opportunities. The, uh, the saucer pass that led to Steele being able to jam one past Jack Campbell was great. And those are the kinds of things that Kirill Kaprizov and Matt Zuccarello need. Is that third member of that line needs to be an active participant. We hounded the Victor Rask, I'm also here, that we got throughout his tenure as center for those two guys. is just being along for the ride as opposed to being an active participant. Sam Steele has done that in every game that he does. He buys himself an opportunity to continue to be in that spot. And uh, some interesting, uh, an interesting response from a question that was asked to Dean Evason about Sam Steele being put on that top line. And uh, I wanted to read it. Jesse Pierce, Bar Down Beauty's podcast, had this on Twitter. And so I'm, taking the snippet from her tweet. But uh, this was Dean Evison's response when asked about Sam Steele on the top line. You don't think that's an intelligent decision? You fi just figured we went through the Rolodex? Sure, we tried different people to play with them. Yeah, but again, it wasn't our decision. It was Sam Steele's decision to go there because he deserved to go through because he played so well. He kept playing better and better and better. Eventually, it's like, who's playing best? Sam is playing the best. Then we wanted someone to go with Boldy, too. So Goudreau goes with Boldy, and then Sam deserves to go up, and he does, and they have had some chemistry now, so it's great. That's the, that's the other part of this, too, is that as players play well, 
they elevate themselves into roles and they keep them based on continuing that production. Will Sam Steele continue this through the course of the season? Hard to say, but right now he is playing well enough to earn himself an opportunity to continue on that line with Kaprizov and Zuccarello. If it gets to the point where he starts to struggle, then the Wild will make a change once again at that spot. But as of right now, he continues to earn himself another game to play with those guys. So that line has been intact as of right now. You have the reformation of the grief line. And that is going to allow for that line to consistently play together. More of a defensive role for those guys, of course. But still, you're getting guys that are consistently on the ice together and are getting opportunities as a unit to help this team win. So now you all of a sudden have two lines that are pretty set. You have part of a third with Matt Boldy and Freddie Goudreau starting to have some uh, good chemistry here over the last few games once again. Goudreau with the goal last night. Boldy with the goal of the game before. Had an assist in last night's game as well. So those guys are starting to take off. Now, they had Nick Patan with them in last night's game. And Patan here uh, up with the Wild until guys like Brandon Duhame Eventually, Ryan Hartman are ready to come back, but ultimately believe that he is more of a placeholder at this point uh, and somebody that will be sent back down to Iowa once Duhame is ready to come back. And then after that, it'll be decision time when Ryan Hartman is, is ready, although it sounds like he is still a ways off from joining this team. But I think... Ultimately, that Boldy line is going to be best served by putting somebody with some speed on that line to complement Matt Boldy's playmaking ability. Judd Zolgad tweeted about it last night. I'm in full agreement that we're seeing kind of that. It's not to say that Boldy is not a great player. It's because he is. He just doesn't have that speed element. And if you put somebody on that line with a speed element, he can make the plays to those guys. He just can't do that stuff himself. So you see the chemistry with Kirill Kaprizov because Kaprizov has that speed. Boldy can put the puck where it needs to be. Kaprizov can get to it. And so the Wild need to put somebody on that line with some speed to allow Matt Boldy to make plays, to throw those touchdown passes, forgive the pun, to throw those touchdown passes to those guys. And so I don't know who it ends up being, if it ends up being Sam Steele when Ryan Hartman's ready to return. We kind of talked about that with Kevin Gorg in the postcast a little bit. But I think in the, in the near term, and Denny, I know you're going to love this one, why not put Connor Dewar on that line? Dewar has the speed. Give him the opportunity to be the burner receiver. Matt Boldy can be the quarterback. Just let those guys throw touchdown passes to each other all night, every game. Give it a shot because now you've got those top two lines pretty set. You can afford to mix and match to try to find those right combos on the Boldy line and the fourth line as well. You get those things set. You roll those lines at opponents game after game after game. Get the continuity, get the chemistry built up, and you start stacking up some wins because these guys are confident. They know what their line mates are going to be doing. Goals, goals, goals. So we'll see what happens because game Saturday, game Sunday, road trip next week. But we're getting to the point where some of these lines are starting to lock into place which is a very good thing for this wild team. Now, what is in store for the weekend and beyond? We'll finish today's episode by taking a look at uh, what the wild have in store on Saturday and Sunday as we finish today's episode of Locked on Wilds after this. Final segment of today's episode of Lockdown Wild. Once again, thanks for making Lockdown Wild your first listen each and every day. Again, for your second listen, make sure you check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, which has a full recap of everything going on 
in the world of sports, and it's all in one place. Locked on Sports Today is available on your favorite podcast platforms absolutely free of charge. The Ducks are in town on Saturday. After that, tough tests once again. And so Anaheim comes in. And look, Anaheim's not having a great season. Although they did play a pretty close game for a while against the Dallas Stars, they ended up losing five rip. This Ducks team's not playing great, but what I worry about in this situation, you have a game Saturday against the Ducks. You have a game Sunday against the division rival Dallas Stars, who are near the top of the division, have one of the most red-hot scorers in the NHL right now in Jason Robertson. This is something that we have seen across sports, all sports, at various times. You have a game sandwiched in between you and a rival. You get caught looking ahead to where all of a sudden that game right in front of you that should be an easy win is not. And I I still think, even in that case, I still think the Wild have enough on the table right now to beat this Anaheim Ducks team that just continues to absolutely uh, just fall into absolute free fall right now and six 16 and two they're eighth in the pacific division and if you look at uh, the numbers even beyond that it just continues to get worse and worse the ducks are two seven and one in their last 10 games they've lost four in a row they have 59 goals scored on the season they've given up 101 goals their differential is minus 44 they are two 10 and 2 on the road and the wild just beat this ducks team when everything seemed to be going wrong for the wild they still managed to beat the ducks 4 to 1 a lot of evidence that suggests that this should be an this should be a pretty convincing win for this wild team and yet because of what we know about minnesota sports in general I have to give the let's not suffer the letdown game speech for this upcoming back-to-back over the weekend. And it's it's a pivotal one. As Kevin Gorg pointed out after the game last night, this gives the Wild an opportunity to go 5-2 and two on this homestand. If they beat the Ducks, they go 5-2 and two on the homestand. All of a sudden, they're 12-9-2. and two. They're above that 500 mark. We're getting to above even goal differential as well. So the Wild are starting to finally kind of pull their heads above the pull-up bar. And with the way that this team is structured, as we've talked about, you don't really have that offense that is capable of just beating everybody regardless of what else is going on throughout the game. Make sure to take care of business in this one. You have arguably the best talent on the team. You've got a goalie situation for Anaheim that is just a disaster at this point in the season. I don't know if it matters who Anaheim starts in this game. We saw John Gibson the last go around. John Gibson is o. 8 and 2 on the road with a 4.46 goals against average and 882 save percentage. It just gets worse no matter how I look at the numbers. So, I will say this. Trap game mentality by me. I hope it's not something we have to even consider for a second on Saturday. Just go take care of business. With it being a back-to-back, you'll probably see Gustafson on Saturday, Flurry on Sunday. Get a strong performance from Gustafson. Early lead for the Wild. Make it a nice, easy, no-stress game. And then gear up for what's going to be an absolute fight against the Dallas Stars. Because all those numbers that I said 
uh, about the Anaheim Ducks. They are about the polar opposite for the Dallas Stars. So here we go. Dallas on the season, 14, 6, and 4, 32 points, leading the Central Division by three points over the Winnipeg Jets. Now, they have played three more games than Winnipeg has. They've played two more games than the Wild have, and they have eight more points. Uh, Dallas is 7-2-2 two two at home, 93 goals on the season. 66 goals allowed. They're 6 1 and 3 in their last 10 games. They have a plus 27 in the goal differential department. Let's talk about Jason Robertson for a second here. Robertson already with 22 goals, 39 total points in 24 games. He has been on an absolute rocket to the moon level tear over his uh, past. Well, pretty much the entire season has been just on an absolute ascension tour so far this year. And even beyond that, you have capable scoring from Jamie Benn. You've got Joe Pavelski. You've got Rupe Hintz, who just locked in on a long-term deal. So you have guys, and you have some of that secondary scoring from Mason Marchman, Wyatt Johnson. You have those guys that are capable of beating you. You also have a goalie in Jake Ottinger, who is is one of probably the better young goalies in the entire NHL. This is going to be a tough game on the road, a fight on the road. And so it is just human nature to gear up for that game and to show up for a game against the Anaheim Ducks. Treat both seriously, and let's get the Anaheim game done. Get that in the front. Get that in the rearview mirror. Get that be. Let that be a win, and go give this Dallas team a test. It's not going to be easy. It's a lot of what Dallas does, um, and trying to figure out how to stop Jason Robertson without Jonas Brodeen. Not easy, especially on the road when you can't line up the grief line as easily against the Robertson line as you could at home. So the Wild are going to have to be on their A game against the Dallas Stars. But don't just assume you can walk in and beat the Anaheim Ducks. Or we'll see something like 4-3 to three like we saw against the Arizona Coyotes. That game had no business being that close. So an interesting weekend ahead of a road trip in which the Wilds will be facing the likes of Calgary, Edmonton, and Vancouver, then Edmonton again at home. So you're seeing Edmonton three times in the span of two weeks. Then Detroit, then Chicago as we move towards the middle of the month of December. Opportunity for this Wild team to get on a little bit of a roll before they see St. Louis for the first time on New Year's Eve. So a good win last night. Opportunity to make it a great homestand with a win on Saturday and what should be an absolutely exciting, fun game against Dallas coming up on Sunday. We will have you covered every step of the way here on Locked on Wild. So make sure that you don't miss out on a single episode or pregame or postcast. We're going to mix in some more of those live pregames. Had a lot of fun doing that uh, before the Edmonton game. So we'll mix in more of those throughout the season. But um, should be an absolutely great weekend. Enjoy it. We will keep you up to date with everything going on with the Minnesota Wild with new episodes every Monday through Friday. So make sure you follow on YouTube, turn notifications on, and follow us on your favorite podcast platforms. There is no one that keeps you up to date on Minnesota Wild hockey better than Lockdown Wild. And it's all part of the Lockdown Sports Podcast Network.